안녕하세요 꾸준한 영어 테드쌤입니다 어, 지난 토요일에는 멀리 부산에서 저희가 워크숍이 있어서 제가 거기에 참석하는 바람에 어, 낭독을 못했었고요 어, 오늘은 이제 챕터별로 한 며칠은 챕터별로 읽어서 지금 챕터 5까지 이제 읽어서 한 챕터씩 올려, 올리는 일을 하고 있고 이건 이제 제가 하나만 읽다 보니까 조금 지겹기도 하고 또 다음 부분에 대한 것들을 빨리 연습해 보고 싶고 뭐 이런 복합적인 마음으로 한 겁니다 어 그래도 음, 한 번씩 읽는 걸꼭 완성을 해야 되겠죠 그래서 이제 또한 번씩 읽는 걸 시작을 할 거고 어 중간중간에 지겹기는 하지만 이렇게 다른 방법들을 조금씩 도입함으로 인해서 새로운 활력소를 찾는 것 같아요 챕터 1을 읽었다가 챕터 2, 챕터 3, 챕터 4, 챕터 5를 읽어보니까 어, 챕터 1에서는 이제 그 안에 있는 단어나 표현이나 내용들이 너무 익숙해져 버림으로 인해서 이제 제가 좀 지겨운데 입 밖으로 나오는 게 마음처럼 잘안 되니까 연습을 하는 것 같아서 어, 그게 이제 어, 지겹지만 해야지 라는 생각이 있었다면 챕터 2, 챕터 3 이제 다른 파트에서 나오는 새로운 표현이나 새로운 단어들이 그러니까 물론 이제 연습을 했었었지만 또 이제 한동안 쉬었잖아요 그래서 그것들이 나오니까 되게 반갑고 뭔가 또왜 우리 그런 거 있잖아요 새로운 것도 배우니까 아 역시 뭔가 하나 더 늘어나는 것 같다 이런 생각 때문에 다른 챕터들을 읽는 거 어, 상당히 저한테는 자극이 되고 좋았습니다 그런데 그런데도 제가 꼭 얘기하고 싶은 건 한번 목표를 정한 거는 중간에 100%, 1000%, 퍼센트 포기하고 싶거나 그만둬야 될 변명거리를 찾더라는 거죠. 저도 지금 찾고 있는 거죠. 그죠? 이렇게 하면 더 좋아질 거라고. 그래서 대부분 하다가 그만둔단 말이죠. 근데 이제는 제가 이제 또 조금 인생이라는 걸 경험을 해봤기 때문에 그 인생 경험에 비추어서 그래도 해야 된다. 그래도 해야 된다. 그래서 꾸준함이 생명이다. 어, 라는 걸꼭 몸소 실천하도록 하겠습니다. 자, 그래서, 이제, chapter 1 읽는데, 오늘은, 어, 화면에서도 보이는 것처럼, editor's note. 물론 이제 다 외웠지만, 제가 이제, 어, 전문을 이북으로 보여드린 적이 없기 때문에, 오늘은 전문을 보여드리면서 읽어보도록 하겠습니다. v e r n i c u l a editor's note. The book you are about to read was brought to my attention in a most unusual way. One Friday afternoon, just before closing time, I heard a scratching sound at the front door of my office. When I opened the door, there before me stood a sad-eyed, drip-eared dog carrying a large, plain envelope in his mouth. He dropped it at my feet, gave me a soulful glance, and with a great quiet dignity sauntered away. Inside the envelope was the manuscript of the book you now hold in your hand, together with this letter. Gentlemen, the enclosed story is true. It happened in this very town to me and the family with whom I reside. I have changed the names of the family in order to protect them. But in all other respects, everything you will read here is factual. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Harold. I come to writing purely by chance. My full-time occupation is dog. I live with Mr. and Mrs. X, called here the Munoz, and their two sons, Toby, aged the eight, and Pete, aged the ten. Also sharing our home is a cat named Chester, whom I am pleased to call my friend. We were a typical American family, and still are. Though the events related in my story have, of course, had their effect on our lives. I hope you will find this tale of sufficient interest to yourself and your readers to warrant its publication. Sincerely, Harold X. Chapter 1 The Arrival I shall never forget the first time I laid these now tired old eyes on our visitor. I had been left at home by the family with the admonition to take care of the house until they returned. 
That's something they always say to me when they go out. Take care of the house, Harold. You are the watchdog. I think it's their way of making up for not taking me with them, as if I wanted to go anyway. You can't lie down at the movies and still see the st still see the screen, and the people think you are being impolite if you fall asleep and start to snore or scratch yourself in public. No, thank you. I'd rather be stretched out on my favorite rug in front of a nice whistling radiator. But I digress. I was talking about the first night. Well, it was cold. The rain was pelting the windows. The wind was howling, and it felt pretty good to be indoors. I was lying on the rug with my head on my paws, just st staring absently at the front door. My friend Chester was curled up on the front velvet armchair. We years ago he'd stake it out as his own. I saw that once again he'd covered the ghoul seat with his cat hair, and I chuckled to myself, picturing the scene tomorrow. Next to grasshoppers, there is nothing that frightens Chester more than the vacuum cleaner. In the midst of this reverie, I heard the car pull into the driveway. I didn't even bother to get up and see who it was. I knew it had to be my family, the Munros. Since it was just about time for the movie to be over, after a moment, the front door flew open. There they stood in the doorway, Toby and Pete and Mom and Dad Morno. There was a flash of lightning, and in its glare, I noticed that Mr. Morno was carrying a little bundle, a bundle with a tiny glistening eyes. Pete and Toby bounded into the room, both talking at the top of their lungs. Toby shouted, Put him over here, Dad. Take your boots off, you're soaking wet, replied his mother, somewhat cunning, I thought, under the circumstances. But, Mom, what about the... First, stop dripping on the carpet. Would somebody like to take this? asked Mr. Mono, include, uh, indicating the bundle with the eyes. I'd like to remove my coat. I will, Pete yelled. No, I will, said Toby. I found him. You will drop him. I will not. You will too. Mom, Pete punched me. I will take him, said Mrs. Mono. Take off your coat this minute. But she became so involved in helping the boys out of their coats that she didn't take him at all. My tranquil evening had been my tranquil evening had been destroyed, and no one had even said hello to me. I whimpered to remind them that I was there. Harold cried Toby, guess what happened to me? And then, all over again, everyone started talking at once. At this point, I feel I must explain something in our family. Everyone treats everyone else with great respect for his or her, her intelligence. That goes for the animals as well as, well as the people. Everything that happens to them is explained to us. It's never been just a good boy, Harold, or you the little boss, Chester, at our house. Oh no. With us, it's... Hey, Harold, Dad got a raid, and now we are in a higher tax bracket. Or come, sit, in the, sit on the bed, Chester, and watch this wild kingdom show. Maybe you will see your relative. Which shows just how thoughtful they are. But after all, Mr. Morno is a college professor. And Mrs. Mono is a lawyer, so we think of it as a rather special household, and we are, therefore, rather special pets. So it wasn't at all surprising to me that they took the time to explain the strange circumstances surrounding the, or, surrounding the arrival of the little bundle with the glistening eyes now among us. It seems that they had arrived at the theater late. And rather than trip over the feet of the audience all lady seated, they decided to sit in the last row, which was empty. They tiptoed in and sat down very quietly, so they wouldn't disturb anyone. Suddenly, Toby, who's the little one, sprang up from his chair and squealed that he had sat on something. Mr. Murno told him to stop making a fuss 
and move to another seat. But in an unusual display of independence, Toby said he wanted to see just what, what it was he had set on. An usher came over to their road to shush them, and Mr. Murner borrowed his flashlight. What they found on Toby's chair was the little blanket bundle that was now sitting on Mr. Murner's lap. They now unwrapped the blanket, and there in the center was a tiny black and white rabbit, sitting in a shoebox filled with dirt. A piece of paper had been tied to his neck with a ribbon. There were words on the paper, but the mourners were unable to decipher them because they were in a totally unfamiliar language. I moved closer for a better look. Now, most people might call me a mongrel. But I have some pretty fancy blood lines running through these veins, and the Russian wolfhound happens to be one of them. Because my family got wronged a lot, I was able to recognize the language as an obscure dialect of the Carpathian mountain region. Roughly translated, it read, take good care of my baby. But I couldn't tell it if but I couldn't tell if it was a note from a believed mother or a piece of a Romanian shit music. The little guy was shivering from fear and cold. It was decided that Mr. Murnau and the boys would make a house for him out of an old crate and some heavy-duty heavy wire mesh from the garage. For the night, the boys would make a bed for him in the shoebox. Toby and Peter ran outside to find the crate, and Mrs. Murnau went, went to the kitchen to get him some milk and lettuce. Mr. Morneau set down a dazed expression in his eyes, as if he were wondering how he came to be sitting in his own living room in a wet raincoat with a strange bunny on his rack. I signaled to Chester, and the two of us casually moved over to a corner of the room. We looked at each other. Well, what do you think? I asked. I don't think rabbits like milk, he answered. Chester and I were unable to continue our conversation because a deafening crash commanded our attention. Pete yelled from the hallway, Mom, Toby broke the rabbit's house. I didn't, I just dropped it. Pete wanted to let me carry it. It's too big. Toby's too little. I'm not, you're too. Okay, fellas. Mrs. Mono called out as she entered with the milk and lettuce. Let's try to get it in here, with as little hysteria as possible, please. Chester turned to me and said under his breath, That lettuce looks, that lettuce looks repulsive. But if there's any milk left, I get it. I certainly wasn't going to argue with him. I'm a workman myself. At that moment, the crate arrived, barely spending barely standing the strain of being pulled in two directions at once. Ma, Toby says he's gonna keep the rabbit in his room. That's not fair. Harold sleeps in his room. Only sometimes, I thought, when I know he's got a leftover ham sandwich in his drawer. Toby's a nice kid, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't hurt that he shared his stash with me. It was, after all, what at one of those late night parties on Toby's room, that I first developed my taste for chocolate cake, and Toby, noting my preference, has kept me in chocolate cake ever since. Pete, on the other hand, doesn't believe in sharing, and the only time I tried to sleep on his bed, he rolled over on me and pinned me by my ears so that I couldn't move for the rest of the night. I had a crick in my neck for days. But he's mine, Toby said. I found him. You you sat on him, you mean. I found him, and he's sleeping in his in my room. You can keep smelling all Harold in your room and Chester too, if you want to, but I'm gonna keep the rabbit in mine. Smelly all Harold? I would have bitten his ankle, but I knew he hadn't changed his thoughts for a week. Smelly indeed. Mr. Murnau spoke up. I think the best place for the rabbit is right here in the living room on that table by the window. It's light there and he will get lots of fresh air. He is taller than I am, Toby cried. He'll be able to see the rabbit better. Too bad, Squirt. Okay, said Mrs. Murnau, through clenched teeth. Let's put him to bed and make him comfortable, 
and then we can all get some sleep. Why? Pete asked. I don't want to go to sleep. Mrs. Munder smiled a little too sweetly at Pete. Look, Ma, said Toby. He's not drinking his milk. Chester nudged me in the ribs. Didn't I tell you? He asked. Excuse me while I make myself available. Hey, said Toby. We gotta name him. Can't that wait until tomorrow? Asked Mr. Munro. The boys shouted in unison. No, he has to have a name right now. I have to say I agreed with them. It took them three days to name me, and those were the three most anxious days of my life. I couldn't sleep at all, worrying that they were really gonna call me fluffy as Mrs. Munro had suggested. Well, all right, sighed Mrs. Munro. What about, oh, uh, say, Bamba? Uh oh, there she goes again, I thought. Where did she get them? Yuck, we all said. Well then, how about Fluffy? She opened, hopefully. Keith looked at his mother and smiled. You never give up, do you, Ma? Meanwhile, Chatter, who had also been named Fluffy for a short time, was rubbing against Mrs. Morton's ankles and purring loudly. No, Chatter, not now, she said, pushing him aside. He wanted to help us name him, don't you, Chatter? Toby asked. As he scooped him up into his arms, Chatter shot me a look. I could tell this was not what he had in mind. Come on, Harold, Toby called. You've got to help with the name too. I joined the family and the serious thinking began. We all peeled into the box. It was the first time I had really seen him. So this is a rabbit, I thought. He sort of looks like a Chatter, only he's got longer ears and a shorter tail and a motor in his nose. Well, said Pete. After a moment, since we found him at the movies, why don't we call him Mr. Johnson? There was a moment of silence. Who's Mr. Johnson? asked Toby. The guy who owns the movie theater, Pete answered. No one seemed to like the idea. How about the prince? said Mr. Munro. Dad, said Toby. Are you kidding? Well, I had a dog named the prince once. He replied, lame me. Prince, I thought, that's a silly name for a dog. We found him at a Dracula movie. Let's call him Dracula, Toby said. That's a stupid name, said Pete. No, it's not. And anyway, I found him, so I should get to name him. Ma, you're not gonna let him name him, are you? That's favoritism, and I'll be traumatized if you do. Mrs. Munno looked in wonder at Pete. Please, Mom, please, Dad, please, let's name him Dracula, cried Toby. Please, please, please. And then with each please, he squeezed the chest a little harder. Mrs. Morno picked up the bowl of milk and moved toward the kitchen. Chatter followed her every movement with his eyes, which now seemed to be popping out of his head. When she reached the kitchen door, she turned back and said, Let's not have any more argument. We'll compromise. He's a bunny and we found him at a Dracula movie, so we'll call him Bunnycula. Bunnycula. That should make everybody happy, including me. What about me? muttered the chatter. I won't be happy until she puts down the milk. Well, guys, is that okay with you? she asked. Toby and Peter looked at one another. And then at the rabbit, a smile grew on Toby's face. Yeah, Ma, I think that name is just right. Pete shrugged. Is that, it's okay, but I get to pit him. Okay, I'm gonna put the milk back in the fridge. Maybe he will drink it tomorrow. What about chatter? Toby said, dropping the frantic cat to the floor. Maybe he would like it. Chester made a bee line for Mrs. Munro and looked up at her plaintively. Oh, Chester doesn't want any more milk, do you, Chester? You've already had your milk today. She reached down, patted Chester on his head, and walked into the kitchen. Chester didn't move. Okay, bedtime, said Mr. Munro. Good night, Bunnicula, Toby said. Good night, Count Bunnicula, Pete said sarcastically. In what I took to be his attempt at a Transylvanian accent, I may be wrong, but I thought I saw a flicker of movement from the cage. Good night, Harold. Good night, Chester. I licked Toby. Good night. Good night, Smelly Harold. Good night, Dumb Chester. I drooled on Peter's foot. Mom, Harold drooled on my foot. Good night, Pete. Mrs. Mourner said with great finality as she came back into the living room and then more calmly. Good night, Harold. Good night, Chester. Mr. and Mrs. Munner went up the stairs together. You know, dear, Mr. Munner said, 
That was very clever. Funicula. I could never have thought of a name like that. Oh, I don't know, Robert. She smiled as she put her arm through his. I think Prince is a lovely name, too. The room was quiet. Chatter was still sitting by the... Closed the kitchen door in a state of shock. Slowly, he turned to me. I wish they had named him Fluffy, was all he said.